My name is Penny Cucci. I'm the co-artistic director of Onmatogsi Storymakers. I'm from Nipissing First Nation, and uh, and my mom's from uh, Tomogamy First Nation. Uh, my name is Sid Bob. I'm the other co-artistic director uh, of the husband-wife duo. <laughs> And uh, my mom's uh, Lee Miracle from uh, Slavertooth, and my dad's uh, Ray Bob from uh, Seabird, in the Stalo. It's in the uh, Salish uh, territory in the Vancouver area. And I've been out here for the better half of my life in Ontario, Anishinaabe uh, country. <laughs> uh, could you please describe the program that you um, that you run? We have a. Uh multi-layered programming. We have uh, regular ongoing workshops with community, community engaged arts, and we do uh, often do uh, multi-arts, so we cross uh, um, visual arts and dance, theater and uh, music, and uh, we often cross uh, intergenerational for 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 intergenerational participants, and uh, and and the art that we we engage with is is often uh, contemporary and customary and traditional arts as well. We have uh, the Onmatogsi Summer Arts Program um, ASAP. It's going into its. Um, 11th year and it started off as a three-week intensive training program for youth and it's uh, then it uh, grew into a six-week uh, program and, and ran kind of under that uh, schedule for a number of years and then last year we had a 12-week uh, training program for youth the age category started off as uh, 8 to 12 in the first few years and then we shifted our focus to uh, high school students. In the last uh, two years, uh, we've focused uh, mainly on high school, college, and university students. But in each year, it's always been um, open to uh, any age categories. And so we've uh, sometimes had young children along with the older group groups or uh, older youth along with the younger groups. The um, second uh, I guess a conventional program that we ran for uh, two different years, not consecutively, was through the um, YTTP, the Youth Theatre Training Program, and that's through Theatre Ontario. And then we've also had, through the um, Professional Theatre Training Program, uh, we've held some uh, mentorship um, programs uh, throughout the years for our professional artists. We've had capacity building initiatives uh, that have provided uh, mentorship opportunities, uh, both administrative and artistic for our uh, company. And each company member picked their own and developed their own training program. And I guess the other thing that we've um, supported is one of the artists applied for a Chalmers professional development funding and uh, Sherry Guppy uh, mentored under Eva Cucci, uh, Penny's mother, in uh, traditional and customary arts, so birch bark work, uh, textile work, and um, a few other mediums, and, and all of our company members uh, coattailed off of that uh, Chalmers um, project. And then in our community engaged arts projects, Dance is a Resistance, and the, our current one, Serpent People, we've had, I guess, uh, Indigenous knowledge transference as a, one of the goals. So through that, we've had um, mentorship and workshop intensives and uh, just kind of general art making as a medium for that knowledge transfer. And so we've had storytellers, uh, sh sharing circles, hide processing workshops, 
meat uh, harvesting kind of processing workshops, uh, deer, goose, beaver, teepee making, uh, Tikkanogan uh, cradle board um, workshops, ash basket workshops, uh, moose and caribou uh, tufting. So, so yeah, it's kind of a, a broad spectrum of like from conventional training to uh, I guess more open or holistic knowledge transference. And what would you say the aim of these programs are? Um, I would say that it's to nurture and um, support a, a thriving artistic community that is uh, committed to well-being and that there's a um, that we're uh, helping to to support the transmission of cultural knowledge and teachings and to to bring forward a lot of the stories that haven't been told that that uh, that really need to be told for the the health and well-being of our planet the uh, some of the you know, we have you know some written documentation that we can share <clears throat> but uh, the uh, summer arts program you know, we focus on individual growth and uh, knowledge, gaining knowledge, uh, knowledge within a number of disciplines, from theater to dance, storytelling, uh, visual arts, installation creation, historic or customary arts, indigenous uh, worldview, plant harvesting and knowledge. Um, other kind of land-based uh, harvesting and um, I guess like a, a hands-on practical working knowledge of, of those as well as the actual I guess more um, theoretical so we, we often do that in a uh, sharing circle or uh, kind of oral uh, practice the um, YTTP was uh, kind of a often a general general working knowledge, uh, hands-on working knowledge of, of uh, theatre and multi-arts. And then um, I guess most, um, most uh, of the community engaged arts is, is hands-on and through the actual practice of skinning and butchering and harvesting. And uh, some of those uh, goals has been to increase the... Um, cultural competency and of uh, the community so that we would have more younger people um, knowing the the the, uh, the stories the teachings and the worldview uh, as well as um, gaining experience as um, being practitioners of those customary and contemporary arts and what, it, in your opinion, makes these programs uh, an example of it, excellence in Indigenous education? Having access to a studio that's um, on a First Nations, that's solely owned and operated by, you know, by First Nations, by artists, you know, that we, we have the time and space to really figure our way through it and to really um, uh, not be confined by, by any um, sort of agendas, outside agendas, so that when, when we're um, investigating, uh, you know, we could be in the middle of a dance class and then someone comes by and says, you know, we, we, um, I just got this, I just got a deer. Uh, will you come and help us harvest? It's like, okay, we can do that because we're not confined by uh, other things that we might be confined by in, 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 in an outside institution. So I think that that having the capacity and the access to cultural knowledge keepers, like right, right within our immediate um, uh, area, having access to land and land-based knowledge and sort of the, the practical... Um, hands-on experience in in uh, cultural uh, um, cultural teachings that are connected to traditional ecological knowledge and then going out on the land 
and then bringing that back into the studio and mixing it with contemporary artistic expression, all of those things, I think, leads to the leads to um, artistic excellence and and excellence in the education and and the way that uh, and the methodology um, that we're exploring. The other uh, one of the, in terms of excellence, we. Um founded our own company, so we have an indigenous board, we're a, a not-for-profit organization, and we often get our funding through the public sector, through arts councils uh, and foundations. We have an indigenous um, artist-led uh, company, so we can operate outside of the, the limitations or policy of, of a First Nation, so we operate independently. Um, we've often partnered with the local First Nation on the Summer Arts Program and the YTTP, um, but we are independent. And that gives us a lot of great opportunities so that uh, the community has a more diverse, it has a really diverse, the Nipissing First Nation is a good example of having a diverse body of educational uh, forums and we often also engage with the local college and university, Nipissing University and Canada College. But because we're on a First Nation we don't have the municipal bylaws to contend with and we also don't have the, uh, the policy limitations of a college and university and so we found that that they're working towards having cultural-based practices and worldview in action, but they have a lot of hurdles to overcome. And so we've hosted sweat lodge ceremonies, Indigenous uh, cookouts, and other uh, land-based um, activities. So I guess in that way, we're, we're similar to a field school and, and other, other kind of in, you know, institutions that operate outside of the college and university systems outside of the First Nations and we've also partnered in the same way with um, the friendship centers and but uh, because they're urban based they, they often face the uh, municipal bylaws so we can have um, we often have we have our teepees up that we've uh, made during our programming and those those teepees uh, don't have to be made by a, a certified uh, company that um, when you're in a municipality and you put up a structure, it often has to be built by a certified company. And so in that way, we would love to be certified, but we, but we don't, but we're not confined or stopped or inhibited by that. We're also a, a company that's rooted in, like it's our artist led and it's also, we have a diverse indigenous kind of first nation artist roster. So I'm, Salish, uh, Penny's Anishinaabe, and so we try and create a, a space that that is inclusive of all those practices, and so we're not just Anishinaabe focused, we're not just Salish uh, focused. We we try and uh, create curriculum and programming that's inclusive of uh, of the First Nations in the area, but also Indigenous people from other communities, and I think that has. In, in that way, we're, we we often try and adopt like a a rights based a rights based programming, uh, so that um, different spiritual and cultural practices are free to operate in our space, but they can't inhibit or exclude any other rights based. And I th so I think that also having a contemporary focus is also sometimes a benefit. So aren't confined by just a historical based view that we that we're that we acknowledge that we're that we're that we are contemporary and a culture is contemporary and shifting and changing so that's just some of the highlights that i think that that you know that we're indigenous led um sovereignty focused and you know we root ourselves in our past but you know with the eye that we're moving into the future and um how do you measure the success of your, your programming? Well, we were just talking about this the other day. In some ways, it's whether or not the people come. Like, and 
Like I remember when we first started out, we were inviting elders in to come and uh, this was before we even had a studio. We were inviting elders to come into our home and we were doing luncheons and uh, and so we would we would make them lunch and then we would sit around and 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 do some story sharing and then we would um, we would uh, show them some videos of the work that we were doing and the the kind of and talk to them about the kind of things that we were interested in. And so sometimes the elders, like they would go away for a long time and come back, you know, even like say four months later and, um, and then knock on the door and say, you know, can I come in for a tea? I want to talk to you about what you were, what you were talking about, you know, and, and how, how we can participate in that. So I think that it's when the community starts coming and, and participating regardless if there's you know if whether regardless if they've been you know contacted you know that they, they, they just come they decide that this is a you know this is a good place to uh, come and make art with us and to to come and um, to bring their other family members too there was there there's this um, one woman that we work with and she said that she that She'd first brought her first daughter uh, to us for our summer arts program, and that was in one of our very early summer arts programs. Maybe um, it might have been like seven years ago. And um, since then, has had almost every single one of her children come through our program. And she says that that's her goal, is to have all five of her kids come through our program, our summer arts program. And so, um, and, and she herself has also participated in a number of our productions and our workshops. She comes regularly to the uh, Wednesday night dance classes. I think that, uh, yeah, like having that endorsement from the community, that's really, really important. And perhaps more important than um, statistics or, you know, because that's not always a, not always necessarily a really uh, reliable uh, way of, um, of measuring that success but yeah if you, if you don't have the support of the community then then I think it's time to look to go back to the community and go okay you know where do our wants and needs intersect with their wants and needs and uh, and then how we how can we move forward together we one of our the we have about um, five co-founding artist members one is, um, well, Penny and Coochie and I are, are two. Carol Guppy, uh, who's uh, an elder and a knowledge keeper in the community. Uh, Penny's, one of Penny's aunt. She's also a co-founding member. Perry McLeod Shabagizik, he's a storyteller and knowledge keeper and works in the health and wellness, Nishnabi health and wellness uh, field. Chicago McQuay out of Sudbury. He's one of the founding members. And so I guess, we, yeah, we're the four original and... Carol, um, we often consult with Carol. So she, not only does she is she like a, a multidisciplinary artist herself, performing in some of the uh, the plays, but also uh, running the sharing circles, doing cultural teachings. But we often consult with uh, with uh, Carol. So she's one of the kind of barometers for how well we're doing or what we're missing. So we always have evaluations uh, with her, and uh, she's a part of the curriculum planning and monitoring of the summer arts program. And then uh, Perry is also um, less so because he's quite busy and travels um, to Sudbury for work, for full-time uh, work. But he's another, another person that we often consult with and also su supports the artists that uh, work with our company, the instructors. We've uh, collaborated with counselors and healers uh, to provide counseling and uh, run sharing circles for the artists, but also for the participants of the Summer Arts Program. And uh, we often consult with them on how they perceive uh, the effectiveness of, of our programming and our, our art making. We do uh, evaluations uh, with the participants, trying to capture the, the challenges, successes, and failures of the program. And often we get uh, a lot of great responses in terms of being highlights sometimes for, for people's highlights for their lives, but also just highlights uh, 
in, in education or learning. So we do fairly well. We don't often have the resources to track those and convert them into statistics as much as I'd like. The, I guess the other, we consult with knowledge keepers in the community to provide uh, critical feedback on the programs that we're running. They don't always agree with our programming on every instance, sometimes because we come from different you know, cultural and spiritual practices. But we do, uh, I think we are in good standing with the key cultural knowledge keepers. They're comfortable using our facilities from our sweat lodges to our studio. And we often do take the time to really create open dialogue about any outstanding grievances and, and work, work those through. So I, I think we have a long-term uh, commitment to our programming, our company, and our activities. And we want to work in partnership with like-minded people. And so education, healing, and growth, kind of on a holistic thing, we, we do try and keep an op open dialogue with all the uh, stakeholders like the college and the universities and, and Nipissing. And so I, th I think we've worked pretty well with all those stakeholders, um, like the participants and, and other, I guess, institutions. Given everything that you both have shared from your perspectives, what is Indigenous education? What does that consist of? I think Indigenous education, uh, for me, is a, a balance between traditional ecological knowledge that's transmitted through story, through the practical hands-on education, like on, on the land, and it passes on uh, knowledge that's been um, passed down through generations. It's community-based, like intergenerational. It's often um, family-based. Uh, family-based learning. It's for the benefit of everyone. It's it's for the benefit of everyone and and all of creation. So uh, so it's towards that towards that end. You know, one of the things that they talk about is is yeah they, that it's towards a good life. You know, like that's what that's the the aim of it. So when we're doing when we're doing uh, workshops and and classes in the studio. That's something that we're always keeping in mind is, is how can we um, provide education uh, training and, and, and workshops uh, within an Indigenous worldview. One of the recent things that we're operating under is this idea of like an inter-arts company. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of um, Indigenous organizations are, uh, are looking at that model as, as a, like a, an arts-based company that operates as a hub between different sectors. And so, you know, you know, we're, we're connecting, operating between educational institutions, community-based organizations like friendship centers, both like First Nations um, governance under the Indian Act on reserves, uh, but also, uh, I imagine also like historic or hereditary governance systems like the, you know, the uh, Haudenosaunee, the Longhouse, um, so I, the inter-arts in that way operates between all these and between families and, be, and between, you know, the general public. So I've often looked at how, you know, yeah, how can we, you know, as a arts organization that's committed to lifelong learning and development mm -hmm. and also like having the goal of gathering as much knowledge uh, as we can to fulfill the voids that are there. So we know we've often looked at the um, colonial impacts of our community, you know, like locally, regionally, and nationally, and what can we do to help uh, address those areas that need, you know, reinvigoration, or how can we support the continuity of what's existing, and then um, what might we need to create uh, in the new context of having, like, institutions and you know a different type of economic system but but in that way i guess it, it, you know indigenous knowledge is as broad you know it's very broad and holistic and that it can take place in all these different spheres and you know from the family to the self to you know the the creative mind and we've often looked at in the last few years looking looking at historic stories as a as an anchor for how to 
look at Indigenous knowledge and transformation. How would you define the, the word Indigenous, and is this a term that you would normally use? I, uh, I guess a, a yes and no. Like, I often operate from a, as a stalo, or um, sometimes I operate out of, out of a First Nation, but I often try and expand beyond that knowing that that's like a, a an in, often it's often not always but it's not solely but in my case Seabird Island is that's that's an Indian Act uh, direct name Slate Tooth is not that name goes beyond uh, the Indian Act but it's still primarily anchored on a reservation system I do use indigenous but I'm, I'm also comfortable using Aboriginal and even Indian when it's talking more about the Indian Act or, or just even kind of the a community identification of, of being being Indian. Yeah, I mean, I like I, I think I'm okay with using in the word ind- indigenous. Well, it's important to me to be specific about where I come from. When, like when my, you know, my and, and when I'm talking about my community, I'm talking about my my family, especially if I'm talking about teachings or knowledge, where knowledge comes from, where. Uh, you know, specific, uh, when, when it relates to specific dialects of language or, or that kind of thing, or, or, or to really be uh, specific about where a story comes from. But uh, I think it's important when, to frame sort of when we're talking about, you know, first peoples, you know, then, that, then I think that the, a term like indigenous is important because just to, to, uh, to understand sort of what we're hopefully all working towards together, you know, uh, which is, I hope, is the uh, protection of the land <laughs> and, and water. <laughs> yeah. What would you say your vision is um, for Indigenous education and for your, your programming over the next 10 years? I would like to have more capacity to to bring more cultural knowledge keepers and teachers, and just teachers in general. I would like to have more capacity to bring more teachers and and students together, so that that we have more capacity to do intensives where we go, where we part of our time is is in the studio. Part of it's on the land, part of it is uh, within the community, and that there's this uh, fluid uh, movement between all of those places. And um, I'm looking forward to, to continue uh, investigating the connections between old stories and contemporary stories and um, traditional and customary arts and contemporary arts. and. Uh, you know, just like, you know, as a, just as a, as a, as an individual who's, you know, my, my parents are both traditional artists and, uh, and my, my work has been pre- primarily contemporary arts and in, 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 in the uh, contemporary arts field. And so I just, for myself, I'd like to understand the connection and the, the intersections between those, uh, two worlds and, um, yeah, and I'd love to. I'd love to, you know, create more, more artwork that that brings forward uh, old stories and makes it more available to more First Nations people, so that they can and and non non Native people as well. Because I think that there's just so many, there's so much knowledge and teachings that haven't had the haven't had the uh, opportunity to be heard by people, the larger world. <laughs> One of the, one of the things that, that um, is one of my goals, and I, th- I think also uh, part of the company's goals is to, is to struggle for uh, self determination, um, and to support uh, the broader uh, struggle for self determination. So, we're aware that there's a continuing trend of the federal government, to not fully support financially, but also, they inhibit the sharing of the resources from Turtle Island. They control uh, the, the resources. 
so that we don't have access to the resources that we have rights to as Indigenous people. Um, so, you know, the, we're aware that the goal of many communities and nations is that they have their rights recognized and that they can determine and govern their own access to the resources and not have the government act as a middleman or middle person. And so we want to operate with full knowledge of, you know, the historical um, framework that we're existing within and then be a part of the knowledge gathering and dissemination of what our rights are, uh, kind of related to the United Nations draft um, or declaration on the rights of Indigenous people. Um, so uh, there's a lot of knowledge gathering that we want to get for ourselves so that we are uh, aware of our rights and that we can be a part of that dialogue of developing our own rights, envisioning our own rights. And I think that the arts has a really powerful role to play in that um, because I think the arts is um, historically one of the really powerful tools of um, knowledge transference, like the, uh, you know, the, the ceremonies, the songs, the stories, um, the, the creation stories, the role that art plays in, in healing ceremonies and major learning points like the naming ceremonies, the uh, clan teachings. There's just a, a lot of the indigenous knowledge that's um, embedded in, a, in an artistic kind of process. So, you know, we, we are always looking at how can we be most effective given the resources that we have. And I think to that end, we're also... Uh, yeah, want to be a part of that moving towards uh, being self-determined so our, our you know, having an indigenous-led arts organization can be a part of that broader movement and then uh, like our in that I guess you know the the historic stories or the classical works we want to make sure that that we push those forward so that you know eventually Canada would have more representation of our classical works because we're aware that we have a lot of you know Shakespeare festivals and Shakespearean focused companies that look at kind of colonial settler classical works but we don't have a lot of indigenous organized arts organizations that focus on our own classical works and so that's that's you know one of the goals that we have is to is to bring awareness to that inequity and and help uh, push the country more towards having our own seat at the table, our own self-determined seat at the table for education and self-governance. And um, lastly, what information or materials or resources, um, aside from funding, of course, that uh, would be necessary to achieve this vision? I think, I think we need access to storytellers and, and elders and cultural knowledge keepers and you know, sometimes when we're when we're exploring a story, we're one of the questions that we're asking is what meaning is within this story, or what teachings or what uh, traditional ecological knowledge is within this is embedded within this story. So, so sometimes that's bringing people in and saying, "What do you hear?" I mean, all the time. Uh, that's uh, that is what we do is we we bring uh, people of all ages, um, people of all abilities. We bring in. Um, people who have specific knowledge about medicines or about uh, traditional foods or about um, they have they have specific plant-based knowledge or knowledge of trees or knowledge of, of uh, animals or or knowledge of other old other old stories that connect to that story so um, uh, you know bringing bringing in in people who have uh, who have an understanding that they can sign. <coughs> Uh, to us, to other people in the community who come to the workshops, uh, you know, so that we can, when we're creating those uh, those stories, that they're, um, all of that knowledge is, is embedded within the stories that we're creating. Some of the uh, things that I think are, like, uh, around education that we've, that I've, have been expressed is from the North Bay community, some of the young people have expressed wanting to learn more accurate, meaningful history about kind of colonial relations and also just other more accurate, self-determined education around, you know, indigenous worldview, Anishinaabe worldview. And that's also something that, you know, that um, 
we would well one of, some of the things that I, I could uh, I hope to see in the future or see disseminated more is like the um, the colonial education so being aware of you know what the Indian Act is um, you know what does it mean while it exists what does it mean when it's taken away Bill C thirty one and the two generation clause like you know, the UNDRIP and so there's a lot of uh, meaningful education that would be great for all Canadians as you know as uh, kind of all you know we are all treaty people and um, but the other thing that is exciting that s some some communities are developing is like their own constitutions based on their own kind of historical frameworks so like um, Nipissing First Nations developing the Chinook I mean my I have some family from the Okanagan and the Okanagan nation is looking at how do they envision their own self-governance self uh, separate from the Indian Act and whether whether it's actually brought into a meaningful existence may not happen but it would be nice to see those documents as they're envisioned and self-determined so yeah those are, those are a, f a few of the things that would be um, good to see in the in the near future the other thing that we've struggled with is how do we create accessible spaces so we work with a lot of elders that we co-producing a play with um, an indigenous group from the US and one of the cast members is 91 years old so how do we how do we make sure that you know that that we're accessible to all those different abilities and ages and I think that's that's really important for for the whole in intergenerational connection um, how do we build our capacity so that that we can be you know like safe while we're doing uh you know things like maple syrup harvesting and, and all. so so we you know we have a number of certification things that we're looking for on our end but also i know that there's a lot of land-based kind of indigenous knowledge-based safety courses like you know safe, safety uh in uh, winter activities safe hunting so in nipissing first nations has been pretty proactive about that and we'd like to see more of that because we, we operate in both worlds. Okay, perfect. Too many questions for your time. Sit and honey.